Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. 1 Peter chapter number 2. We're going to be in verses 13 to verse number 17. If you weren't able to bring a Bible with you, there should be one in front of you, under you, behind you. you page number 954 in that Bible. First Peter, we believe that we ought to have a Bible open. We, we, there's something supernatural about studying the Word of God together and letting the words penetrate you. It's a, it's a book that's alive. It's a supernatural book. And when you let those words get into your eyes or get into your heart, it has the power to penetrate and to open and to move like no other book can do. No other book compares to this book right here. And it's a powerful book. If you do not own a Bible, we invite you to take that Bible home. Just promise us one thing, that you will read it this week and you will study it and you will learn it with us uh, as you leave this place. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse numbers 13 to verse number 17. Uh, They're in this study this morning that, that we have called hope in a world that is not our own. We're walking through this text as we've, as we've been doing so over the last few months. And if you are a guest with us this morning, you should be able to jump right in the study with us. You can go online and get caught up with it if you'd like. But we've been walking through this, this study that is Peter is writing to, to Christ followers that are the first century church. They are in uh, modern day Turkey, but at that time it was Asia Minor. And they were new followers of Christ. And the first century, the New Testament church was being birthed. And He's writing to them how to carry themselves in a world that is hostile towards their identity in Christ, hostile towards the things of God, a a world that he calls them in chapter one, verse number one, elect exiles of the dispersion. They were they were exiles. They were sojourners. You're, you see it in, in our study. We see uh, sojourners thinking of a, of a refugee or a gypsy or a vagabond, somebody that does not belong on this earth anymore, somebody that is an alien of this earth. They're a pilgrim of this earth because now their citizenship is in heaven. How do they, how do they operate and live and conduct themselves in a world that their citizenship is no longer part of? They have a new home, a new destination, And as we arrive at this study today and at these verses, the reality is, is that submission is not a comfortable topic. Submission is not a comfortable experience. And we said last week, the book of Peter is going to pivot and begin to go a different direction. And we see this pivot continuing and and Peter's going to write about submission this week and next week and the weeks ahead about about submitting as humans, as followers of Christ on this earth to to authority and then slaves submitting to their masters and husbands and wives submitting to each other. And we understand that that word submission, I'm I'm sure as I'm saying it, kind of just irks you a little bit, right? Like we don't like to think about that word submission. I remember as a kid growing up, I'm the youngest of four boys. And uh, my mom, she was a pretty uh, uh, authoritarian leader in our home, and she had everything a certain way. And, and I remember the time that we were wrestling, and we wrestled every day, but I remember the time that we wrestled on the couch, and we snapped the legs off the couch, and mom had to find out. We tried to put it up on books, okay, and uh, hoping she would not see the books under the couch, but the legs snapped off. And and uh, I'm the youngest of these boys, and I, I remember growing up and egging my brothers on. I, I, I can tend to have a big mouth sometimes, and, and egging them on. And you know how to, you know how to pull the buttons, uh, push the buttons of your siblings, don't you? If you have siblings, there's something called sibling rivalry, and you know exactly what to say and how to say it just to get under their skin. And that's like the evil side of all of us, right? And I had, I had the tendency to do that a lot. And, and I was the youngest, so that meant I was the, I was the smallest and the weakest. And, and I didn't think it, but I was. And, and so they would tackle me and they'd, they'd pin me down and we'd be wrestling. And I would try so hard to get out of being pinned down and so hard to, to break free of it. But they would say these words to me, submit, submit. And I'm sorry to put this mental picture in your head, but they would, they would hawk loogies. And you know what a loogie is, right? And, and they would dangle it out of their mouth until it touched your forehead. And then they'd suck it back up real fast. They'd keep doing it. You'd be crying out, I'm going to tell mom, I'm going to tell mom, I'm going to tell mom. And they'd say, submit. 
And my brothers would say, call me Lord, call me King, call me Master, submit. And sure enough, man, I had to submit. It was not a comfortable experience at all. Submission is not something that we uh, like to talk about. It's not a comfortable topic. It's not a comfortable experience. But what we see as we, as we walk into this passage this morning is that the gospel changing us means that submission is one of the primary fruits of our transformation. Submission is one of the primary fruits of our transformation. And so as we've been given truth after truth after truth after truth after truth about, about who we are in Christ, about what Christ has done for us, as Peter has spent week upon week writing and unpacking, and we've gone verse by verse and line through line as we do here at church every single week through books of the Bible. He has written about who we are and what we are and, and who we are in Christ. And now he pivots and he's directing towards this primary fruit of gospel transformation. And it is this idea of submission. We're going to pick up in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 11 to get some context and then move into our teaching passage this morning, 13 to verse number 17. 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 11. Beloved. We talked about that term last week. It means loved one. Hey, loved one, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Beginning in verse number 13, submission to authority. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, and that by doing good, you shall put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. And these are the words of God. The big idea that we have this morning, if you want to jot it down in your journal or if you want to jot it down in your handout this morning, we believe it's important to take notes and to remember what you learn and go home and study it further in your own study time. As I told the first service, the shortest pencil is longer than the best memory or the longest memory. Write it down. This is our big idea, our key thought this morning that we're going to walk away with. Christ followers' allegiance to the Lord is recognizable by their submission to authority. Christ followers' allegiance to the Lord is recognizable by their submission to authority. And here's what we're gonna do this morning. We're gonna talk a little bit about it. Two things you're never supposed to talk about, right, in public. Don't talk about religion and don't talk about government. And we're gonna jump into both of them, man, all right? We're just gonna go heads first and we're gonna do a backflip and see what kind of wave we can make, all right? Here's what I wanna begin with. If God has got you, like I'm saying, if God has snatched you by his grace into this relationship, if you are one of God's chosen elect, if you are his royal priesthood, if you are his sojourner, if you are one of his elect exiles, if you have given faith to Jesus Christ and you are his follower, you have seen that you were lost, and you have seen that your sin separated you from God, and that because of that separation, you are going to spend eternity under the wrath of God, unless you received an atonement, a covering for your sin. And you realize that Jesus lived that perfect life and that Jesus died that substitutionary death and that Jesus rose again in that victorious resurrection. And you felt the spirit of God calling you to himself and God by his grace snatched you in. If God has got you, if God has changed you, and if your allegiance is to the Lord, then it will be recognizable by your submission to authority. Now, this is not a comfortable passage to walk through. It's one of those passages that I wanna skip around and move away from. Because it's a passage I personally feel the weight of. But we can't do that, can we? Because as we commit to go verse by verse and line by line through the Bible, you've gotta walk through some tough verses. And this is a passage, no doubt, that is not natural for any of us. In our natural state, we do not like to submit. In my natural state, I don't want to submit to nobody. If you tell me to do something, I'm not going to do it. And I'm not going to do it with a smile on my face. If you tell me not to do something, I'm going to do it right in front of you with a smile on my face. <laughs> like that's our natural bent. 
that we battle with. The idea of authority structures, the idea of subjecting ourselves, the idea of submitting ourselves is something that we all battle with. So I'm not up here this morning as a messenger of God trying to tell you, hey, I got this one down. You little people need to get it. No, I'm up here saying the word of God says it. And if the word of God says it, then we need to submit to the word of God. Period. We have to. So the big question I have for you this morning that we want to prove this idea that Christ followers allegiance to the Lord is recognizable by their submission to authority. The question I have is if Christ followers allegiance to the Lord is recognizable by their submission to authority, then how do you achieve a submissive heart? Because I look at this, I'm like, okay, how do I achieve a submissive heart? Because I want my allegiance to the Lord to be recognizable. God has got me. God has saved me. I'm one of God's elect exiles in his sovereign plan, placing me on this earth for this time. I believe that I have a mission on this earth. That mission is rooted in verse numbers nine and 10 of chapter two, that we proclaim the excellencies of King Jesus. God has not saved us, as we said last week, that we would go live in a bunch of monasteries. God didn't save us that we would hide from the world. God didn't save us that we would move to a far away land, a far away country where no sin exists. It doesn't exist. There's no such place as that. God has saved us to be in the culture. God has saved us to be in the world. And I want my allegiance to the Lord to be recognizable on this earth. And so if my allegiance to the Lord is recognizable by my submission, and if your allegiance to the Lord is recognizable by your submission to authority, then how do you achieve a submissive heart? Here's how we're going to do it this morning. We're going to give you four thoughts, all coming right out of the Bible. And they're all going to begin with this statement, you achieve a submissive heart by, and then you're going to fill it in, study it, unpack it, bring it to your group studies this week, bring it to your coffee shop studies, and die, uh, unpack this together over conversations, and let the Spirit of God do what the Spirit of God wants to do in your heart. Amen? So number one, you achieve a submissive heart by putting a high value on the Lord. You achieve a submissive heart by putting a high value on the Lord. We see in verse number 13, as Peter says, be subject for the Lord's sake. Don't notice that. Notice that for the Lord's sake to every human institution. So the central theme of this section that we see here is is found in these first two words. Be subject or be submitted. Live in submission to human authority. The idea that Jesus followers should submit to human authority is a standard part of New Testament exhortation. And Peter says here in his reminder to his readers and as a reminder to us, be subject for the Lord's sake. If you do not get that phrase, for the Lord's sake, then it's going to confuse everything else we walk through when we deal with slaves to masters, husbands to wives, and wives to husbands. It's going to confuse everything. It's for the Lord's sake. We're not told to obey authority in order to get more of God's love or to get more of God's acceptance. As we've already said, Peter has spent week after week and verse after verse writing to us that we have this acceptance, we have this forgiveness, we have this relationship with God the Father. If we put faith in Jesus Christ, believing in his sinless life for you, believing in his substitutionary death for you, believing in his victorious resurrection for you, All of us that have put faith in that message are God's chosen ones. We are fully accepted and can fully rest in God's grace. We are his royal priesthood. You are his holy people. You are his unique people. And because of this truth, we now live under the lordship of King Jesus, proclaiming his excellencies with our life and with our conduct. So Christ followers obeying governing authorities ultimately is because of our reverence and our submission to the Lord. So what is our application? The motivation for submitting to any authority structure 
is Jesus himself. You name whatever authority structure it is, the motivation behind us submitting is rooted in Jesus Christ himself. The motive behind our submission is the Lord's sake. It is for the Lord, the Lord's benefit. The motivation for submission to authority is that the Lord would get the glory from our lives. That through our submission, the world would see that our lives have been transformed by the gospel. And through that church family, God is glorified. They see there's a difference about Christ followers And that difference isn't because we are better people. That difference is because the gospel of Jesus Christ has transformed us. The apostle Paul reminded his readers in his writings to the church of Corinth. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, he says, for you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So what do we do? Glorify God in your body. And what Peter's trying to do is teach us how do we glorify God now? Like, how do we bring glory to the name of God? We spent two verses last week talking about about God being glorified by our good conduct in our community. And he's continuing to talk about this idea of, of how do we lift high the name of the Lord? How do we live for the Lord's benefit? And we come to church each week and we, we sing songs of worship. The Lord be praised. The Lord be lifted high. The Lord be glorified. But the reality is this morning, the way that we bring praise to the Lord, the way that we lift the Lord high, the way that we bring glory to the Lord is by valuing the Lord more than we value ourselves. So what must we do? We need to get Jesus back on the throne. How valuable is the Lord's name to you? Because here's what we know. The biggest competitor for the value of the Lord is the value of me. That is a statement that we don't have to disagree on. The biggest competitor for the value of the Lord is the value of me. Who's on the throne? The Lord's name or my name? I'm in charge. And what we know is value system is driving motivation. If you are on the throne of your life, then you're going to be motivated for things that fall under your agenda and your ideology and what you believe and who you're going to be loyal to. But if King Jesus is on the throne, then I'm going to be motivated to live for his benefit and for what lifts his name up high. Philippians 3.8, the apostle Paul, one of the leaders of the first century church, In Philippians 3, 8, he says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. He says, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish. If you grew up on the King James Version, I I count them as dung in order that I might gain Christ. What does he say? He says, I count everything I've gained as loss for the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ. My value for God and for Christ is the biggest thing in my life, is what Paul is saying. The value of Christ to you this week, the value of Christ to me this week, will have a big impact on how I submit this week under the authorities that God has placed in my life. So the first thing we see, You achieve a submissive heart with all authority structures, you name them, by putting a high value on the Lord. Number two, you achieve a submissive heart by surrendering to the Lord's sovereignty. You achieve a submissive heart by surrendering to the Lord's sovereignty. Notice what we see in 1 Peter 2, the end of 13 down to 14. Whether it be the emperor as supreme, emperor, think about a king, or to governors sent by, notice this, sent by who? Sent by him, we see God's sovereignty, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. We can parallel 1 Peter with Romans 13, 1 and 2, 
Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Again, God's sovereign design, God's sovereign purpose, God's sovereign plan. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. So we need to surrender to the Lord's sovereignty. The Lord has designed a system. He has a, he has a design for his, for his land that, that is his and, and he has a, a sovereign plan here. The Lord in his sovereign design has put emperors and governing authorities in place. And what we learn from this is that authority is from God's design. These rulers are God's creatures created by God and existing under his lordship. As we walk through these verses, because I know what many of you are thinking, like you just don't understand, Nick. You don't understand how wicked our systems of government are. You don't understand how corrupt it is. Let me remind you, As we walk through these verses, the king, the emperor he's talking about that was on the throne when the the elect exiles of the dispersion that were in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, the reigning emperor was Nero. He was the king. You say, who is Nero? Go home today and just put in Nero. Do a study on Nero. There's things that he did and ways he conducted himself that I can't even speak of from this platform, but he was one of the most fierce and hateful leaders to ever rule. And his hatred was especially directed towards Christ's followers. And so no, as they were receiving this letter, they didn't have some incredibly kind, Jesus-loving leader that pampered them and did everything they wanted them to do. No, they were in hostile territory. They were in hostile land and there was hostility and hatred and persecution and lies and affliction and oppression being put on these people. And Peter no doubt knew that it would be very easy for these first century Christ followers to rebel and to revolt and to try to lead a revolution. But Peter reminds them that the powers that be are under the sovereign plan of God. God, in his sovereign plan, has designed human authority, and God, in his sovereign plan, has instituted authority and authority structures. You say, why do these authority structures exist? We don't need no authority. We need no one telling us what to do. Why do they exist? Verse 14, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So God, in his sovereign design, And God in his sovereign plan has instituted authority to keep evil in check to some extent, to prevent societies from collapsing into complete anarchy. Now, hold on a second. I know where your mind is going because it's where my mind goes so often. Where my mind is, more times than I want to meet, um, admit I don't see our emperors and I don't see our governing authorities always punishing evil and always praising good. Actually, I see the contrary. I see them sometimes punishing good and praising evil. No doubt this would have been (laughs) what the Christ followers living in Asia Minor would have thought when they got Peter's letter. Like, oh, great, Peter, come on, man. Do you know who our leader is? They would have thought that. But but Peter did not intend to say that rulers always fulfill such a purpose. Peter was not living in a box with no windows. He was quite aware from the Old Testament that, that rulers may resist God and his will. And there's a reason for that. Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, the persecution of believers indicates that rulers may be involved unjustly in oppressing believers. Peter, early, uh, uh, Peter and the early Christians could hardly forget that, that Christ was unjustly condemned under Pontius Pilate. And that, that James was put to death by Herod Agrippa. Because of sin and depravity, 
of human hearts, God's structure and order gets muddy. Just like your home ain't perfect. Why? God intends for you to be the right kind of husband and the right kind of wife, but because of depraved sinful hearts, it gets muddy. We see that. What's our application? So as God's exiles, as God's sojourners, as pilgrims, as aliens, as refugees, as gypsies, whatever you want to call it, we see it all through 1 Peter. We are citizens of another land. We have a new king, a higher leader. We belong there. How do we in a world that is not our own, how do we operate? How do we conduct ourselves? Here's what we do. We respect God's sovereign design and we live as good citizens, obeying the laws of the land and humbly submitting to human authorities. You say, when is it okay to disobey? Because I want to disobey. You know, like, when to disobey, right? I want to disobey. So tell me when I can disobey because I want the right to walk out of it and disobey. All right. There's a few instances given to us in the Bible, but Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Acts 5, 27 to 30, you can read it, but Acts chapter 5, verse 29, primarily the first century church leaders were told they could not preach the gospel. They were told they were not allowed to preach the gospel. They needed to stop with the message. And they stood before the governing authorities and they said these words, we have to obey God rather than man. With that being said, we understand that there are reasons and at times to disobey. We understand that, that ultimately our king and our leader is God. And when we are told not to do something that we clearly see is biblically grounded in scripture that we have to do as Christ followers, then there is grounds for not obeying. But we don't walk around town with our shoulders put back and our chest sticking out trying to pick a fight with authority. No, we humbly submit and obey because we know that we belong to a different land. We've been transformed by the gospel and we now live our lives with a high value of the Lord above our own agenda. And we surrender to the Lord's sovereign design. So we have this surrender to the Lord's sovereignty. So we achieve a submissive heart. You achieve a submissive heart by putting a high value on the Lord, by surrendering to the Lord's sovereignty. And thirdly, you receive a submissive heart by understanding the Lord's purpose. Notice what we see in verse 15, the Lord's purpose. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Whenever you see this is the will of God, that means you underline it, highlight it, and say, I got to listen to this. It's God's will. Peter here says that it is the will of God. It is God's will for you, elect exiles. For those of you that have been captured by grace, snatched by God's grace, for the sojourners, for his refugees who are citizens of another land, that by doing good on this earth, what is good? What is good in this context? Well, good is connected back to verse 13, submitting to emperors and governing authorities. That in doing good, it silences the ignorance of foolish people when they speak evil against believers. So by submitting to authority, Christ followers demonstrate that they are good citizens, not anarchists. The outcome of their submission is they, they extinguish the criticism of those who are ignorant and revile them. In 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse 12, Peter said, as we learned last week, keep your conduct among the Gentiles. The Gentiles referring to the lost world, honorable. So they speak against you as evildoers. They may see your good deeds. They see the gospel transformation on your life and they glorify God on the day of visitation when they are met with the saving grace of Jesus Christ. On their day of visitation, God is glorified and you had part in not bringing down the name of Jesus, but by promoting the name of Jesus by your good conduct. So our submission to authority and our good conduct shows the watching world that the gospel has transformed us. It silences their attacks on us 
And we could say it has the potential to bring the lost world to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And in that, God is glorified. So basically, we don't walk around looking for a reason to be an anarchist and looking for a reason to revolt and looking for a reason to rebel. No, the contrary. We walk around looking for ways to submit, looking for ways to bring glory to God. I think so often this, this flare of rebellion is creeping over God's church. It's getting louder and louder and stronger and stronger and stronger. And I'm fearful that it's contrary to actually God's word and what it teaches us. And we try to have a gospel conversation with somebody and they say, you're a Jesus follower? Oh, I couldn't tell. What about 1 Peter chapter two? Like I always hear how you talk. What about 1 Peter two? No, but that we would conduct ourselves in a way that silences the critics of the unbelievers. And let me say this, church fam, because I know where some of you are at. I know my audience. And I know where your brain is and I know where my brain is too, okay? You say, is Peter promoting the idea that believers do whatever the government tells them to do? Not at all. Peter says in chapter three, verse 17, you can flip a page over or push your finger on your iPad. First Peter 3, 17, for it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. We obviously understand he's saying here that, that there are gonna be times where you are going to have to choose to disobey governing authorities because it contradicts God's clear teaching in scripture. I'm not seeking that out. I'm not looking for that. But there are times where it has to happen. And therefore you will be suffer for that, but it is better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil, if it is God's will. Peter did not envision a society. Peter did not envision a governmental structure as always siding with believers or inevitably commending them for their good behavior. His point was that, that the good behavior of Christians, as much as we can do to the extent the word of God allows us, that the good behavior of Christians will minimize the slanderous attacks on believers. So what's our application? Like if we just kind of go down into this thing, like we cannot be effective proclaimers of the gospel and not pay our taxes. Oh man, dude. I lost you. <laughs> like last week, 11 and 12, you're like, okay, man, gospel transformation, be distinct, be different in the world, do good deeds for your neighbor. I, uh, I believe that I know I need to do good deeds for my neighbor. I bring them popcorn and movies and pizza. I know I need to do good deeds for my neighbor. I want to show my good conduct. But now you're telling me that I got to submit to an authority structure that I disagree with? God has a purpose for your submission. And if you're gonna get a submissive heart, you have got to surrender and understand the Lord's purpose. I've got to understand the Lord's purpose. We could say this, church family. We could say this, that God in his sovereignty allowed wicked rulers to reign so that his followers, those that have been transformed by the gospel can demonstrate our transformation and our allegiance to the Lord through our submission. Like if everyone we dealt with in life was all for us and always cheered us on and always did everything good for us, how would we have a chance to submit ourselves and show the gospel transformation if we lived in a world where there was no harm done to us? Like we have an opportunity to show our transformation through our submission. Those that have been transformed by the gospel can demonstrate our transformation and we can demonstrate our allegiance to the Lord through our submission. So that as the watching world speaks attacks against you, their attacks are silenced by your submission. Not because you are afraid of man. No, man, it has nothing to do with the king. It has nothing to do with the emperor. It has nothing to do with the governing authorities. Get your mind off of that. That's where, that's where ideologies pull you into, these, these labels. It has nothing to do with the man or the woman or the person. It has all to do of our loyalty to the Lord. And therefore, you want to follow his will for your life. Say, why in the world? And think about this. This passage is being taught all over the world where there are Christ followers. American Christians are not the only Christians in the world, all right? American Christianity is all throughout the world where there are underground churches being persecuted 
and beheaded and burned at the stake, having their Bibles taken away. Why would God raise up wicked rulers? And we could say this, we could say that God raises up wicked rulers so that through the persecution of believers, he is glorified by them showing their allegiance to the Lord. Like the, the, you say, what is the primary responsibility of man on this earth? It is to bring glory to God through everything. You say, why would God raise up authority structures and why is this God's design and why are these authority structures? You think about some fierce evil leaders in the world, even going back to the Old Testament. We could say that God raises up wicked rulers so that he is glorified by pouring out his wrath upon them on the day of judgment. We read that in the book of Romans. God is glorified through redeeming lost people and God is glorified through pouring out his wrath in judgment on unbelievers. Both of those bring glory to God and both are underneath God's sovereignty. Those that are saved are underneath God's sovereignty. He is glorified when they come to repentance. And the day of judgment on the day where God's wrath is pulled out on the wicked and the ungodly and unbelieving, guess what? God is gonna be glorified on that day. And they're both underneath his sovereignty. So we've learned. And I'm not telling you to take my words for it. I'm telling you to humbly bow and submit yourself to the word of God and the authority of the word of God and let the word of God mold your heart, amen? It's all we're trying to do this morning. No agendas, no one being targeted. You think you are, but you're not. You're not that important, okay? You're not being targeted. If you feel targeted, it's the spirit of God going at you right now. Let him go. So you achieve a submissive heart by putting a high value on the Lord. You achieve a submissive heart by surrendering to the Lord's sovereignty. You achieve a submissive heart by understanding the Lord's purpose. And fourthly, you achieve a submissive heart by living in submission to God. And this is where it's got to kind of lay out right here. Notice what he says in verse 16. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. So what do we see from there? We achieve a sense of heart by living in submission to God. He says, he says, don't use your freedom for selfish causes. Like we have seen so many people take stances in the name of Christ and the freedom they have in Christ. But they weren't biblical stances even. Don't use the name of Christ to cover up your evil agendas and you're doing it saying, I'm doing it in my freedom in Jesus. The freedom that we have does not leave us without influence, family. The freedom we have does not leave us without influence. The freedom in Christ does not leave us up to our own personal agenda. Freedom in Christ doesn't allow us to make the rules for our life. Freedom in Christ doesn't allow us to make up the plan. Freedom in Christ doesn't allow us to live for our own purposes. To the contrary, rather, freedom in Christ means that the power of sin that held us, yes, that power of sin that we could do nothing but sin, we could do nothing but rebel, as Romans 2 says, Romans 2 and 3, nobody could come after God. All were running away from God and all were cursing God out as they were running away from him. And it is God's grace that snatched us in. We could do nothing but rebel. That power has been broken through Jesus Christ. And praise God. Praise God that that power of sin has been broken. The consequences of sin is death. If you live in the power of sin, then you die and face the wrath of God. But through Jesus Christ, when you place your faith in him, believing in the one that lived a perfect life for you in perfect obedience, believing in the one who died a substitutionary death, believing in the one who rose in victorious resurrection, if you place your faith in him, then the power of sin has been broken. You have freedom. You are a slave of no party. You're a slave of no ideology. You're a slave of no sin. You're a slave of no agenda. Guess what? Nobody owns you. So stop letting them claim you. One person owns you. His name is King Jesus. He owns you. You are his servant. This freedom now is to pursue God's design. This freedom now is to pursue God's purpose for your life. It is a freedom to obey and to reflect the righteousness of your Savior. 
Jesus had these conversations with his disciples so often. We are tempted like verse 16 says. We are tempted like verse 16 says, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil. We've all seen people do that. If we are not careful, and let me just say that, not to sound judgmental, I've done that. If we are not careful because our sin nature, we will use our freedom as a cover up to pursue our own agenda. We are human beings and we love to manipulate the truth. And in the name of freedom, we will live in opposition to the righteousness of Christ. In the name of freedom, we will live in complete opposition to what God's will is for you. Let me say this. We don't subject ourselves to emperors or governors because we owe them anything because of them. You owe them nothing. Get your mind off of the political office or the leader or the king. You owe them nothing. Their merit or worth or authority is not why we subject ourselves to them. We subject ourselves to them because we are servants of a higher king and in the name of freedom, this king sends us into the world where he has established in his sovereignty these authorities and we submit to them for the Lord's sake because God is our master. Not the emperor, not the governor, God is our master. And therefore we follow his will. The Lord is exalted over the emperor, the Lord is exalted over the governor, and we use our freedom in submission. The Lord sent us into exile to be subjected. The Lord placed you in a world that is not your own. The Lord sent you as a sojourner, as a gypsy, as a vagabond, not to pursue your own agenda, but you have a citizenship in heaven and you're on this earth to be subject and by your good deeds, silence the attack of the evil speakers. Jot down Romans 6. Go home this week, study Romans 6, 15 to 23. Romans 6, 15 to 23, Paul clearly shows us that freedom from sin now gives us the opportunity to be instruments for righteousness. You are free for a purpose. Okay, 1 Peter 2, 17. Hey guys, I don't like this as much as you don't, all right? <laughs> we're walking through it together, okay? And we're submitting to the word of God, amen? 1 Peter 2, 17, ready? Here it is, honor everyone. Honor everyone. I can do that. I can honor everyone. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Uh Uh-oh. Honor the emperor. What does he say? First of all, honor everyone. Hey, respect and care. I know you see Christ followers being honorary. I can be honorary. Anyone else in this room be honorary sometimes? No one? You guys are all perfect, man. Anyone of you can can make fun of people or not show respect or not properly care. Christ's followers ought to be the most caring and respectful people on this planet. Honor everyone is the bedrock. It is the foundation. We walk around and we care ourselves in honor, regardless of our disagreements, regardless of our different agendas, regardless of, of how they treat us. We honor everyone. We, we abound in honor. We abound in care. We abound in respect. Listen, family, listen. That is a distinction of gospel transformation. It's like that is a mark we must have. So as the world tries to suck you into hateful speech, as your friends try to get you to like comments that are degrading of other human beings, And as you get sucked into tribalism and who's better than who or who's right and who's wrong, live above that. Can I tell you, you are free from that. You are free from all those other ideologies and all those other identities. You are free from that and now you're a servant of God. So live above that, on mission, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. That's talking about the church family. Yes, the person you try to avoid every week. All right, love the brotherhood, all right? We come together. Love the brother. Like, this is like Jesus love. Like, what is Jesus love? Jesus love is lay out his life for you. That's why in Jesus' teaching, he told his disciples, by this will all men know that you're my disciples, that you would lay your lives down. May we be a congregation and may we be a family of God where our love is so deep and it is so authentic that we would lay our lives down that it would be so deep and so true and so genuine and so real 
that when people in our city walk through these doors, they say there's something unique in this air. It's not just religious people coming to church on a Sunday. No, it is people that love Jesus and that love each other are gathering as a family to learn and to study and to live on mission for King Jesus. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. May I say to you, family, we never fear man. So often people say, well, I'm not going to submit. I don't, I don't fear man. Right, you don't fear man, but you submit to God and his will. Honor the emperor. It's almost like I look at Peter, like Peter might have a little bit of a stubborn side to him. You know, he's riding this side. Hey, honor everyone. Okay, I can do that. Love the right. I can do that. Fear God, I can do that. Now, uh, uh, period. Hey, don't forget about this. Honor the emperor. Honor the emperor. So what is our learn to live? As we button this thing up, as we walk out these doors, what is our learn to live? What is your value of the Lord? Like I'm talking this morning, like, like who's on the throne right now? Maybe it's an ideology that's on the throne. Maybe it's an agenda that's on the throne. But if it's not the Lord, then you have put yourself above the Lord. Are you valuing the Lord above all other values? Above all other systems? Above all other ideologies? I love the Lord above all, and he's on the throne. If you're in this room today, and you've never by faith received Christ Jesus as your savior, then the way that you value the Lord is you come to him in humility this morning, confessing that you're a sinner, confessing that you are not good enough to get to heaven on your own, confessing that no matter how good you try to be, it'll never be good enough to get to heaven, confessing that there's only one way to heaven, it is Jesus, he's the way, the truth, the life, and confessing that you believe that Jesus lived a perfect life, and that he died a substitutionary death, and that he rose in a victorious resurrection, and he rules and reigns in heaven today, and you're humbling yourself before Jesus, and you're receiving the gospel message. I pray you do that. Second, learn to live. What contributes to your rebellion? Like, we all got triggers, right? Like, you got certain things that set you off? Anyone? No? Okay, I got things that set me off. We got triggers. What contributes to your rebellion? I'll tell you right now, I got no shortage of friends sending me every article to my Facebook page, trying to get me to revolt and rebel. I got no shortage of those friends, man. I got no shortage of YouTube links getting sent to me. I got no shortage of every conspiracy in the book getting sent to me. I got no shortage of people saying, rebel, revolt, run away. Get out of that dictatorship, California. Get away from communism. Run, rebel. I got no shortage of that. And here's what I've learned about myself. And some of you that have known me a while, you know I got some triggers. And I get sucked into some of those things. And I start sitting there, I'm like, that's right. How dare them? You know what? I'm going to go be a politician. I'm going to go make a difference. Or I'm going to go and hide up in a mountain somewhere and, and run for my life. We begin to get angry at people around us, right? We begin to look at people in our city and we begin to look at them differently and, and begin to think things about them. We begin to get sucked into these things and they contribute to our rebellion. So what's contributing? Third, thirdly, how are you using your freedom in Jesus daily? You have freedom in Jesus. You've been broken from the chains of sin. How are you using your freedom in Jesus daily? Are you using your freedom in Jesus to pursue your own agenda, to pursue your own mission, to pursue your own ways? Or are you using your freedom in Jesus to go and love our city, to go and love the leaders of our city, to go and love the neighbors on your street, to go and love the people outside of our city? to pray for our city, to pray for our leaders, to pray for our country? Are you using your freedom in Jesus daily to do good in our city and to submit? And where you can't submit, take the consequences. But we try hard in all our areas to submit because we know that Christ followers' allegiance to the Lord is recognizable by their submission to authority. Amen? So as we leave these walls, we go out into our city and we go to Baskin Robbins and grab an ice cream on our way out. 
Use your freedom in Jesus to live on mission for him, amen? Let's use our freedom right, don't abuse it. Let's pray together. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth in it.